So, first up is, is Mark Drongesma. He's a professor of material science and engineering, worked with us for, for many, many years, and has a very interesting project with uh, Shanhui Fan, and we look forward to, to hearing from him. So, Mark, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here and discuss a little bit of work on a project that we're doing together with uh, Shen Hui Fan's group, let's say here, over here. He's the theoretician of the team. I'm the experimentalist. And we're trying to see whether we can bridge the length scales of the atomic scale all the way to the length scales of the universe. And we're hoping to use atomically thin materials, things like graphene or molybdenum disulfide, hexagonal boron nitride, to achieve passive uh, cooling of buildings, ultimately, and sort of intriguing that you could do this with atomically thin materials. Why we're doing that? Well, uh, right now in the United States, we're currently using about 15% of our electricity uh, for air conditioning purposes, and that puts a notable amount of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could reduce energy com uh, consumption by pulling cooling roofs onto all of our buildings and uh, reduce our electricity consumption? So the way it goes is as follows. We're very used to harvesting energy from the sun, for example, using photovoltaics. And we're ultimately from an energy perspective, using the energy differential between the sun, which is hot, 6,000 Kelvin, and the much cooler earth at 300 Kelvin to harvest energy. And this can be done at efficiencies that were long time ago, uh, already predicted by uh, Carnot in terms of efficiency limits that depend on the temperature of the hot and the cold body. Now, intriguingly, uh, one may not fully realize, but one can also harvest energy from another uh, temperature differential, which is the Earth hot as seen as a hot body as compared to the cold universe. So there's a notable about 300 Kelvin differential. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use all that space around it to harvest uh, energy? And sort of interesting to note that the energy flux towards from the sun towards the Earth is actually balanced by this energy flux out. Otherwise, the Earth would notably heat up uh, over time. So there's notable energy to be uh, fluxes to be uh, uh, tapped into. So we do have very good radiative access. The way we can connect to the universe is by radiating thermal radiation. Uh, there's good radi uh, radiative access, but we need very careful engineering, and this is in part why we're doing this uh, project with Shen Hui's group. If you think about a simple experiment where we might have a, a thermal emitter that we would like to cool down, maybe put it in an insula thermally insulating environment from the Earth uh, surface, it could radiate uh, uh, day and night out to the universe, to the cold uh, space, but there's a blanket here, the atmosphere, that actually acts as a filter that filters out certain frequencies of light or uh, electromagnetic radiation. And this, is, this filter characteristic of the atmosphere is shown here. Here's the transmission through the sky as you're looking at the universe at some wavelength in the visible. We can nicely see the universe, but uh, at longer wavelength, where actually the Earth emits a lot of radiation, uh, there are strong absorptions, for example, by CO2 or water. There, uh, the electromagnetic radiation can excite vibrations of such uh, rotations of such uh, molecules. So if I plot on top of this wavelength, here's the visible, here's the mid-infrared, the thermal radiation, the black body emission of the uh, Earth it looks something like that. There's a peak here around maybe 8, 9, uh, 10 micron, where uh, we would love to have a high thermal emissivity in a region, a spectral region here, maybe from 8 to 13 micron, where there's a good transmissivity. So if we let a body radiate all of its energy at that, uh, those wavelengths, then it can get good space access, and it should cool down ultimately if we have good thermal insulation here uh, to the uh, temperatures of the, the universe. 
So how do we design such a thing? We use a fundamental law called Kirchhoff's law that says for an object in thermodynamic equilibrium, the emissivity is uh, equal to the absorptivity in terms of its uh, frequency and angular dependence. So it basically says if something absorbs well at a certain wavelength, and if I shine light at it from a certain angle, then it will also thermally it emit well at that frequency and that angle. So it becomes a very simple problem. We just need to find things that very well absorb in the spectral range at these wavelengths, then they could also thermally emit well. So Shen Hui, my uh, dear collaborator here, you see him here in the center with his students, uh, started doing some of this work already a long time ago in 2014, building layered structures of dielectrics and insulators, but also some uh, materials such as silicon and, and silver absorbing uh, materials, uh, and made these stacks, engineered their thicknesses carefully to be highly reflective in the visible, so it should look mirror-like in the visible, then uh, such a material could uh, not absorb the heat of the sun in the visible and therefore not heat up uh, tremendously because there's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, energy coming in the visible spectrum. Here you see uh, the solar uh, uh, emissivity here, the, uh, the AM1 solar spectrum, and here you can see the, the low uh, reflectivity of their sample that allows them to see themselves. However, these layers uh, were designed such that there is strong uh, absorption and therefore thermal emission also in the mid-infrared. Of course, this is a, a quite complicated stack that uh, maybe is expensive to make uh, using uh, deposition techniques. So would it be wonderful that we could ultimately use a single or a few atomic layers of material? That's sort of the concept of this uh, project. Here you see some of the uh, experiments that they did. Here's their little uh, wafer that looks at the sky. Here uh, they test it on the roof of the building across uh, the, the quad here. And here they look at the temperature versus the time of day, morning to uh, mid-afternoon. Here uh, you see the temperature, the ambient uh, air temperature. And here at this time, 10 o'clock, Good time for students to start experiments after coffee. You can see they looked at the temperature with a little temperature sensor of this, uh, this wafer and they see uh, the temperature rapidly dropped below ambient air temperature in daylight uh, and then started following, but at a lower temperature, the, the ambient temperature uh, in the air. They, so they showed daytime cooling and this work attracted a lot of uh, attention. You can, as a brief intermezzo, you can uh, not only just heat, uh, or uh, sorry, cool by thermally radiating, you can actually directly use this to make uh, energy and drive an LED. So here was an example which was sort of a, a proof of concept that uh, got featured in the New York Times where there's a radiative cooler that was designed to uh, thermally radiate connected to a thermoelectric to uh, a room temperature area, and using this temperature differential, the thermoelectric can produce a little electricity that drives an LED. So it's a very simple system where there's no energy storage with batteries needed that directly can provide uh, uh, a little bit of light, for example, in a home, maybe in a, a distant uh, a desert somewhere far away from electricity nets, one can, uh, in this initial proof of concept, derive a little bit of power per square meter, enough to drive an LED that allows you to read a book very far away from um, the net. Okay, so Shen Hui and his students didn't sit still. They started designing more advanced to more perfectly engineer the spectral absorption, therefore spectral uh, emissivity properties and things came out like this, multiple stacks of different materials, silicon carbide, titanium oxide, things that have interesting lattice or phononic resonances in the mid IR structures on top to try and approximate this emissivity spectra and they found that uh, ultimately they can uh, very uh, closely match the transmissivity uh, window and get sub-freezing temperatures right underneath uh, the sun and cooling that could uh, 
exceed here in theory 100 watts per square meter. That's sort of a, a goal. So it's something like a tenth of what you may harvest from uh, uh, sun with solar energy. So how do we make this simpler? Maybe we don't want this uh, very complex stack that's nanostructured, etc. And to understand uh, our approach, I want to go back to uh, a little bit of history here. Michael Faraday showed that very small, and that's the key point, very small nanostructures can be extremely strong tunable absorbers. So he made colloidal suspensions of gold nanoparticles that were later analyzed in the transmission electron microscope that give this liquid that has many gold particles in it this ruby red uh, color. You can take a transmission spectrum through this. Here's the, for gold particles, the absorption versus wavelength across the visible. And you can see that the gold particles show a peaked, look like a resonant uh, response in the absorption right here in the yellow part of the spectrum. You see the blues and the yellows get absorbed, but in the red, there's not much absorption. That's why if you illuminate it with white light from the back, it gets this beautiful ruby red color. The key point is that a single layer of such gold particles uh, on a glass substrate can already absorb about 50% of the light. Very strong absorption. So this has uh, uh, caused, and some of the nice work was here funded by GSEP, a lot of people uh, to think about how do we understand the light absorption properties of metallic and other nanostructures. Can we optimize them? And the interesting thing is here, if you look at the length scale that goes from millimeters to nanometers, and somewhere here, the wavelength scale of light that's critical in optics, the optical properties of a little mirror, a continuous metal sheet, completely change as you go to the nanoscale. And here's examples of vials, now engineered, gold particles of different size and shape to cause absorption at any wavelength across the spectrum, even into the mid-infrared, where we want to have strong absorption. And the key uh, piece of physics here is that in a metal, when you shine light, the electric fields that oscillate back and forth very quickly can drive oscillating currents. But if you have a finite-sized particle, your little sphere, then these currents run into walls and then uh, when a current runs in a wall, you have charge buildup. Electrons run into the bottom, putting negative charge. But of charge neutrality, there are positive charges. And these uh, two charges pull at each other through the Coulombic force. There's a restoring force on the displaced electrons that are driven by the electric fields of the light. And this works much akin to a mass spring system. If I have a little mass attached to a spring and I let it go, the mass will oscillate. Here, I have the masses of the electrons being pulled back by the Coulomb force, giving a resonance like a mass spring. And this resonance here determines at what wavelength I get strong absorption. So sort of nice that Faraday already did work to, to, that now is starting to have an impact. And here's sort of an evolution. Here's 20 years of history, quite recent history from 2007, where people tried to make metallic structures of different shape. These are electron microscopy images of gold particles. And uh, you can see that the different shapes and different metals all uh, produce absorption and scattering at different wavelengths. The resonances can be moved. Then people started putting two together, then multiple particles. And now we can make entire paintings that are generated. If you would look at this painting in the micro electron microscope, you would see metal particles of all different sizes and shapes. We, the key point here is that we can control light absorption at will now over large areas using uh, uh, current nanopatterning techniques. So what can we do with all of this when we start controlling building? Well, if we have control over absorption at every frequency, we could make something that looks like a beautiful color, maybe a red Stanford roof, but has the ideal thermal emission spectrum in the mid-infrared. And that's here an experiment shown here, temperature versus time of day, similar uh, measurements on the roof across the street. Uh, uh, different pieces, I don't know whether you can see that, but one a little piece looks black, one looks uh, pink, and it turns out that although these have different uh, colors, they may have similar uh, blackness in the, 
in the 8 to 13 micron range. So we can independently make black paints or, or, or pink paints and, uh, uh, or other paints. You can see that uh, things that have the same color here could have very different uh, temperatures uh, uh, as a function of the daytime because we manipulate differently the mid-IR uh, thermal emissions. So things can look cooler than black paint or things can look uh, measure hotter than black paint. So we can independently tune. Another interesting question is, could we dynamically tune thermal emission? Because maybe clouds roll out uh, over us in the sky and we would want to manipulate the thermal emissivity spectrally throughout the day. All sorts of interesting questions. So to solve this, we're proposing, and that's the key of our current project to see whether we can achieve light absorption control with tunable, spectrally tunable, uh, atomically thin layers. And some of this work has recently uh, gotten a lot of attention that if you have a, a single atomic layer, for example, here a little experiment of tungsten disulfide, one of the known atomically thin semiconductors, there you can make transitions from a valence to a conduction band and make electron hole pairs or excitons and that uh, causes strong absorption. And this absorption actually, uh, characterized by the real and imaginary part of the refractive index, the imaginary part giving the strong absorption uh, as a function of energy is highly tunable. So it's interesting, you have a thin, atomically thin material that very strongly absorbs but it's also tunable if I apply electric fields. Here's another, this is a, a low temperature experiment, but people are pushing this to high temperatures now where there's an atomically thin semiconductor molybdenum diselenide. If you look at it, here's the little flake seen in white light reflection. And if you inject charges into it, you change the electronic properties and it becomes completely black. So they show that low temperatures you get unity reflection or absorption changes. So this inspired a lot of the work we're doing, some of the work here uh, uh, in our own group uh, at Stanford, we made little tungsten disulfide islands that we can uh, electrically inject charges into. Uh, you can see in this case there's not a resonance of the sloshing electrons, but there's an electron hole pair resonance that shows up in the reflectivity versus wavelengths. You see peaks in the absorption. These peaks uh, note are pronounced, but quite small here, the reflectivity uh, changes uh, are, are on the order of uh, percent. So we need to do something better to get um, uh, to, to uh, a stronger reflectivity or absorption changes. But note that, for example, if we inject charges into this, these excitons, electron hole pairs completely disappear. So the key here is that we can tune spectral reflectivity, one of the early works in our groups, and it's quite reproducible. Here you go. Uh, inject the current, take the charges out, put them back in, we can get these resonances on demand. Okay, so what can we do with these atomically thin materials for radiative cooling? Here's a simulation that we did with uh, Shen Hui based on things we believe we can make. Uh, we make uh, carpets of uh, atomically thin material and these, uh, for example, graphene hexagonal boronitride, we can get these now on, or on four inch or six inch wafers uh, commercially. Uh, when you pattern this into little strips, you get very similar to these metallic particles that Faraday studied, so-called plasmonic or collective electron resonances, meaning that if I shine light, the light has an electric field that rapidly oscillates. This electric field can induce current oscillations, displace the charges in a doped uh, piece of graphene, which uh, acts in this case metallic-like, and there will again be these restoring forces that can give resonances. If I make the, the, the width of a certain size, what I'll see is uh, if I calculate the absorption and thereby the emissivity as a function of wavelength, that this monolayer of graphene sitting above a metallic mirror can achieve an emissivity that reaches almost unity, which it means it's equal in its emissivity as a black body uh, thermal emitter. So that's pretty impressive for a single atomic layer. Moreover, uh, in contrast to most black bodies, here we can easily tune it by changing the width of this little strip. So here you see the, the wavelength at which 
I get strong uh, thermal emission. Here's the, the emissivity plotted in a color scale. So yellow means very strong thermal emissivity. Here's the ribbon width, and you can see that we can tune it. So we can start making ribbons of different width or different shapes, and that's the goal of this project, to start having multiple resonances uh, fit the entire uh, absorption spectrum. So we can start tuning and engineering the thermal uh, emissivity. And it's, it's quite nice because note that the, wave, the width of these strips is only 40 nanometers. That gives you this strong uh, absorption. So we can fit many of these little resonators of different size and shape within about the diffraction limit of light. There are other, uh, I guess, materials that we want to use, and that's hexagonal uh, boron nitride here. Uh, written often as HBN. And HBN doesn't have a good uh, electrical conductivity, but it has a very good uh, phononic resonance. So you can drive lattice vibrations and thereby transfer light energy to, uh, directly to the, the lattice. And note, here's the emissivity versus wavelength for, versus, in this case, we checked out the number of layers. And you can see, interestingly enough, that the number of layers uh, uh, tunes the spectral emissivity. But also by tuning it, we can get to very high emissivities, again, for a limited number of uh, layers. So there are all of these interesting materials. Uh, maybe we'll use combinations of these to get uh, unity absorption in the window that we want. Experimentally, we wanted to boost uh, some of our light absorption in these materials. And to do that, we're exploring uh, the use of uh, corrugated mirrors. And we're using right now tungsten disulfide as a model uh, system. And we're seeing whether if we can shine light in, reflected of this interesting corrugated mirror that I'll explain more, can we modulate the reflected light indicating that we're tuning uh, and modulating maybe the, the absorption inside this structure. So we also have an electrode here that can inject the charge in the tungsten disulfide, thereby change its optical properties. So uh, if you, and this is interesting physics, if you shine light on a corrugated mirror, so here's a, a cross section, here's a, a metal film that we uh, dig in little groove using the nano patterning tools we have available at Stanford, then light takes a very interesting path uh, here we simulate the flow of light as given by the pointing vector. And in, in free space over here, where we radiate at normal instance, light goes in straight lines. Luckily, that's what we know. Uh, but near these metallic structures, interesting, the flow of light gets redirected and goes into the groove. That's pretty interesting. The way that works, actually, is that the light comes in. The electric field drives current oscillations. And the current oscillations, note, for example, if the negative electrons move to the left in each of the, the teeth, that we get opposite charges across the gap and therefore a very high field concentration in this gap. That's one way of thinking about this field re redirection. So we've made such structures. Here's the schematic design, tungsten disulfide, thin oxide, grooves in the metal. This is one unit cell. Here you see a little corrugation in a silver film. And here's an optical simulation that shows the field intensity. So using these corrugations, we can get about 15 times more field uh, intensity and therefore uh, notably uh, more absorption, which kills with the field strength squared. So we want to use these to uh, enhance absorption. Here's, uh, I guess here, I guess this project is in progress since maybe November or so. Uh, some of the simulations we've been doing, here's the reflection versus uh, wavelength. We can tune uh, the electron hole pairs on and off or change the optical properties. And we get about here now 20% absorption change. Here's a, I guess, a reflectance ratio, if you take the ratio of these curves. So we've been able to start seeing these things in experiment. Here's reflectance changes when we a dope the material with electrons or holes, and we can start seeing the characteristic uh, reflectance changes, and they are uh, very reproducible in time. So what I, I guess, want to conclude here is that uh, atomically thin materials are exhibiting very strong light matter interaction. They're electrically tunable. They're engineeringable in their absorption spectrum. 
uh, and hopefully by the end of this project, uh, we'll show that uh, we can do this over large area and, and get notable uh, cooling throughout daytime. So thank you so much for your attention. If anyone has any questions? Yeah. No, I was going to say this is, in my mind, beautiful work because it, 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 it incorporates so many things uh, in, in, the, in the Andes, the, in, in India, in the highlands, people can radiate energy to make ice or protect their crops with green plants. Uh, Professor Winston at, Ch at Chicago made these non-optical uh, devices, but what you have here is like almost an electromagnetic lensing is what you have. It's, it's that's right, we're trying to use the tricks of nanophotonics to enhance light matter interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I'll be here. Yeah. Could you comment a little more on your vision for how it scales up in size? Because a lot of these techniques you show are not amenable to scaling up, and I'm just curious how you see that. Yeah, so, so it's a very good uh, question. So. We, uh, we believe, one, that uh, the developments on uh, generating these materials over large area uh, is uh, happening very rapidly. So we can get commercial, uh, 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 I guess, wafers of uh, single layer graphene or multi-layer is a little bit easier over large area. So a four, six inch is uh, quite common. Same for hexagonal boron nitride. Another nice thing is that for uh, the uh, quality that we need for these uh, absorption uh, systems is not as high as people would like to have in the semiconductor electronics industry where, where sort of the push right now is to develop better and better materials over a uh, large, large area. Uh, so th there's, uh, I guess, the belief if we do the research now on that front, the fabrication uh, uh, or the synthesis of these materials will, will be there. Uh, the other part is nano patterning, and I think uh, techniques such as nano imprint lithography, or there are now uh, new types of uh, optical rolling lithography techniques that are uh, relatively, getting uh, relatively inexpensive, sort of at the, the few dollars per square meter uh, cost level. Uh, these uh, techniques can now make uh, uh, sort of nanostructures on the sort of the 40, 50 nanometer scale that we hope to use. So I, I, I guess we're, uh, uh, I guess, excited about uh, all of this pro progress. We couldn't do it yet, maybe uh, tomorrow, but I think by the time we start six new companies, to, no, we, uh, but by the time this has developed, if we can show it works, I think uh, there, there will be a path. If you could do this at large scale, what's the impact on whatever energy demand and, and so on? I think there's been some people kind of trying to estimate that. Is that, has anything changed? Like are is some of the techniques you're developing, could that change the, the total impact on kind of energy demand? Cooling? Well, well, yeah, I think we're trying to solve a little bit uh, of a different challenge, for example, as, as with, or complement maybe, that's a better way of saying it, uh, for example, solar energy harvesting or other techniques that can harvest uh, energy. This is something that can work day and night, could have solutions where maybe in some cases we don't need uh, energy uh, storage. I think uh, what we're targeting is uh, uh, sort of twofold. One, can we uh, uh, reduce the electricity consumption for uh, for air conditioning, so this could sit maybe on, on buildings, maybe we believe these things could be lighter maybe than solar uh, modules, although uh, that's to be determined. Uh, so that's one uh, area where we're uh, probably not going to compete with solar utility because solar get, get more energy per unit. Uh, area, so there's some specific applications. And then there's, I think, applications, can we impact the life of uh, people living in a little village somewhere uh, far away from the, the grid where we can, in nighttime, provide uh, energy storage in a very robust, I think, fashion without the need for batteries and other things, uh, infrastructure that could go wrong. So 
I, yeah, I think many of the th uh, things in scaling still hold it's just one maybe extra uh, component that can help.